I'm Kathy Dalianis. I'm a member of the governing board here at the Unitarian Universalist Church in Ruston. I'm so happy to see so many people here despite the rain. So thank you, all of you who braved the rain. And welcome to all of you on Zoom who are probably cozy in your pajamas and laughing at us who came in the rain. So welcome, everyone. Um, no matter how old or how young you are, wherever you are in your spiritual journey, please know that you're welcome here. We have a couple of announcements this morning. I'm going to start off by um, having Reverend Scott make an announcement. Actually, three quick things. First, there is a sign-up sheet for the November 5th anti-racism workshop. We're flying in Andrew Sorbo, an historian from Connecticut, to talk about the historical antecedents and how we've gotten to the systematic race place that we have. Please, that's about uh, four weeks away. Please sign up for that. It's nine to two. We're gonna provide you with lunch. And it's important for us to talk about this as we move toward thinking about the eighth principle of Unitarian Universalism. Also, I'll be having a brown bag lunch this week. Um, and I didn't write it down, is it Thursday? Thursday at noon, you bring a brown bag, I'll provide beverages and we'll just see where the conversation takes us. So please join us for that. Um, and also the big news is our capital drive is doing very well. We have achieved most of our goal, but we are not there yet. We still need the full participation of everyone, but our, the campaign is going very, very well. And I see no reason why we'll not achieve our goal and then some. So please, if you haven't yet submitted a pledge, please do so. Um, we, the, the key to this, our success is to get 100% participation from all who are able to do so. All right, uh, Randy, come on up. We're having a part of the search process is a beyond categorical thinking workshop. One of my children, I developed this program 30 years ago. Indeed, indeed. So yeah, an update from the Ministerial Search Committee. We have the Beyond Categorical Thinking Workshop this Saturday. Lunch will be provided if you're here in person. You can also attend just by Zoom. We will not provide lunch if you're not here, okay? <laughs> Um, sign up is available online, also in the foyer over there. Uh, we are also uh, have begun our cottage meetings to get feedback from you all in small groups. Those signups are also in that foyer. Um, please do sign up. The beyond categorical thinking is really important for attendance. Um, it lets our prospective ministers know how serious we are about making sure that we're very inclusive and it opens up the possibilities for who we can accept as our minister um, and help us recognize whether our, or how ready our church is for any sort of minister that we might be able to find. And we want our best minister we can get, no matter what race, uh, ethnicity, gender, um, uh, sexuality, etc. Um, we want our best minister we can get. We need to make sure that we're ready for it. Thank you. Uh, back to Kath. Hi, just a couple more uh, quick announcements this morning. Uh, first of all, I want to announce that our auction uh, is our biggest fundraiser. Uh, all the money goes to our um, general fund. Um, it's on November 12th, so save the date. We have a, our auction website, which is our catalog, is um, open for business. Um, they're going to put something in the chat. It's togetherauction.com slash UURustin. There's instructions there and also here how to sign in. It's very easy. It's great. It's a lot of fun. After two years of virtual auctions, we are doing an in-person event on Saturday, November 12th. There'll be food. There'll be drinks. I think the youth group may do a bake sale. And if not, we're going to have lots of dessert anyway. So. Um, we are selling uh, raffle tickets for our two raffles starting today in the foyer. You can also go online. So um, it's my favorite event, can you tell? <laughs> um, one other announcement, our 50th anniversary committee has put together this beautiful yearbook. We still have a lot of copies for sale. Those are available also in the lobby after the service. You can also order them online. I don't have the URL with me, but um, I could probably email it to you after the service if you if you don't have a cash or check or just are, are at home and want to buy it online. So just you can send me an email. OK, now I would like to introduce our service participants for today. The service is being led by Reverend Scott Alexander. We are joined by Linda Weaver, our director of religious education. 
Uh, Randy Newton is leading the hymns today. Cynthia uh, Weaver, um, Cynthia Young is out. We also um, are happy to have our accompanist, Catherine Grimble, back with us today. And we have a special guest musician, um, Brienne Nicole Steiff, who is our flautist for today. So thank you all. Uh, thank you all who are participating in the service today. Um, and now let's take a breath, center ourselves for worship, and listen to the beautiful prelude. So it's a great day for ducks, but not so much for walking on the Potomac or playing outdoor tennis or playing soccer or going bird watching or biking, though of course that may not stop me as a mad dog and Englishman, I go out in the rain. But anyway, it's a great day for church. This is a perfectly suitable morning for being here to reflect together on our lives to challenge our minds and hearts, to grow our souls, to become better persons than we were yesterday, spreading our love and compassion out to those beyond us. The rain this morning is cold and wet. It's just plain yicky, but it's not, and it's not so much a day for outdoors. So welcome into this place of warmth and purpose. Welcome. Our opening hymn with heart and mind. Opening hymn this morning is hymn number 300 in the gray hymnal. Um, if you're on Zoom, uh, the words will be in your chat box. They may or may not be projected behind me. They are definitely in the gray hymnal and in your order of service. Um, please rise in spirit or body uh, as you're able and join me. Um, you can sing along at home to uh, hymn 300 with heart and mind. With heart and mind and voice and hand, may we this time and place transcend to make our purpose understood. Yeah. 
Good morning. Good morning. I'm Sterling Paulette. Welcome to our church. We light this chalice for us to be reminded that despite our imperfections, we are still blessed in so many different ways. May our hearts and minds always value the beauty in each of us, knowing that each of us carries that little spark within. And if we collectively share that little spark, we can create a bigger light to illuminate our bruised and broken world. UUCR, we have a tradition of singing our covenant together every Sunday. Love is the spirit of this church. The words are in the order of service. Um, they will be in the Zoom box. Uh, they may be projected behind me. Um, we will remain seated for the singing of our covenant. And if you're visiting us for the first time, please accept this song as our blessing to you. time for all ages so if you're feeling young of body or young of spirit and would like to come sit on the floor up here please do good morning good morning it's wonderful to see so many people with us today and you can sit on the floor right here welcome welcome hi and julia you can sit on the floor hello hi our story today is a traditional story from India. And in this story, once there was a lovely white elephant that was the pride and joy of the king. The white elephant lived in a special stable. And one day, a dog came and smelled bits of food that the elephant had dropped on the floor of the stable. So the dog came and ate the food. Well, this was a great treat for that stray dog. So day after day, the dog came to the stable and ate food that the elephant had dropped on the floor. After a while, the dog and the elephant became great friends. Have you heard of dogs and elephants being friends? Mm, that seems pretty unusual, doesn't it? But the, oh, you have. Okay. But well, this dog and this elephant became really good friends. In fact, the elephant began to wait for the dog to eat its fill before it ate its food. And at night, the two lay down together in the stable and slept. When they felt like playing, the dog would jump up into the elephant's trunk and the elephant would swing the dog back and forth. Well, all was good until one day a farmer walked by the stable and saw this dog. He went up to the uh, elephant keeper and said, oh, I would love to have a dog that has such a great temperament. Could I buy it from you? Well, the elephant keeper didn't care about the dog and thought it might be nice to have a little extra money. 
So he agreed to take a fair price for the dog, and the farmer took the dog home. That day, when it was time to eat, the elephant wouldn't eat. When it was time to bathe, the elephant keeper tried to take the elephant to the stream, but the elephant wouldn't budge. It just sat in a corner. And at night, this elephant didn't sleep well. This went on for the next day and the next day. And then the elephant keeper went to the king and told him about this prize elephant. And when he heard it, the king asked his advisor to go and check on the elephant. The advisor did. The advisor looked up and down at the elephant and turned to the elephant keeper and said, there's nothing wrong with this elephant's body. It looks fine, except the elephant looks very sad. Did it have a playmate that's gone? The, the elephant keeper told him about the dog and that he had no idea where this farmer lived. So when the king heard all of this, he put out a declaration that said, I am looking for this dog and anyone who we find with it will be fined a huge amount of money. Well, the farmer heard this, and what do you think he did? He gave the dog to that. Yes, he let the dog go, because he didn't want that big fine. And the dog ran all the way back to the stable, and when the elephant saw the dog, he picked the dog up in his trunk and swung, swung it back and forth. And from then on, no one tried to separate the dog and elephant. And do you think they lived happily ever after with no arguments or disagreements? Yes. yes. <laughs> Probably not. However, <laughs> they cared for each other so much that they stayed together, took care of one another, had fun together, and lived as happily as they could for the rest of their days. And the dog and the elephant are kind of like people here in this congregation. They chose to be friends. They chose to be together and care for one another. Reverend Scott will be talking more about that later in the service. And the children will be going downstairs to their classes. And if we have anyone in high school, we have our high school group meeting downstairs also. So we'll sing the children out with Go With Joy. great to see kids starting to come back after the two years of COVID nonsense. It's just great. Now is the time in our service when we share our joys and concerns so that no one has to hold them alone. I know everyone in this room holds concern and love for all of the many people affected by the Hurricane Ian. We are foregoing our collection in the church to get more money for the church this Sunday. The entire collection this morning uh, will go to the UUA Hurricane Relief Fund. They pick a couple of very uh, good organizations to give to, especially for relief for the people in Florida. Uh, I was there Monday, not on the West Coast, mercifully, on the East Coast. Our, our home was fine. But if you'd like to contribute, either put cash or a check in. If you put a check in the offertory, put Hurricane Relief in the memo line. We're going to be gathering these up for the next week or so. Uh, those of you at home can can do the, the, the usual process, but we're going to be gathering checks in cash, and then we'll send it all in, and we'll let you know how much we have given. And if you want to make a pledge uh, pledge payment today, that's fine. Just make sure on the check 
you write that this is part of your pledge in the memo line, all the cash and all the new checks that say hurricane relief will go to Florida and to relief. So those of us joining remotely as um, members of the congregation come forward and take stones to symbolize what is on their hearts this morning, you can light a symbolic candle or a chalice. And uh, if you wish to share something, those of you who are remote, probably about 40 households today, you can just write that in the memo line in the Zoom, and I'm, I'm sorry, in the Zoom, <laughs> in the chat, thank you, not the memo line, the chat line, and let us know what is happening. And do remember that whatever you write in the chat does become public. Uh, now, as our accompanist plays piano, people can come forward and place a stone for everything that's on their hearts. And if they wish to take a stone from around the water vessel to remind them this week what is on their hearts, they may do so. May our ritual of joys and concerns begin. Let us be one in spirit and in prayer. Spirit of life and love that so faithfully animates this creation, we are grateful for this community, which promises to be with us in both times of joy and sorrow. We do hold in our hearts all those near and far who are facing any hardship or difficulty, those who are grieving, facing illness, disability, or loss, and of course, to so many millions in Florida who continue to reel under the powerful and destructive force of this hurricane of last week. Whether shared here this morning or held silently in our hearts, 
May our joys be multiplied in community, and may all gathered here this hour find comfort and calm. Amen. As Reverend Scott already mentioned, all of today's collection plate will be going to the UUA Disaster Relief Fund. Um, the, um, this fund allows the UUA to respond flexibly um, on, on uh, our behalf to tragedies affecting communities throughout the country and throughout the world. Um, if you'd like to make a donation, you can put your donation in the collection plate today. Please designate your check as uh, disaster relief or hurricane relief, you know, so just so we know that it's not a pledge and another, another payment. For those of you paying online, there should be a link in the chat, and there's actually a special drop down. Thank you, Megan, for setting that up so you can choose the disaster relief fund. Uh, so thank you for your contributions. It's important sometimes not to disrupt worship, but that was so beautiful. Thank you very much. Brianne, we hope you'll come back sometime. Okay. So this morning, 
I continue my 2022 UUCR Autumn Sermon Series entitled The Five Smooth Stones of Religious Liberalism, which is inspired by the work of the Reverend Dr. James Luther Adams. Dr. Adams, after he abandoned his family's fundamentalist Baptist background, was a UU parish minister at a church in Salem, Massachusetts, which is now the Witch Museum, actually, but that's neither here nor there. He was a longtime divinity school professor and is widely recognized in, as Wikipedia puts it, quote, as the most influential theologian among American Unitarian Universalists of the 20th century. Jim, as he was simply known to his friends, was a brilliant and very gentle guy who wrote and spoke widely about UU thought and practice and is best remembered for his 1976 book, on being human religiously. In this book, his editor, the Reverend Max Stackhouse, laid out Dr. Adams's thought in this famous nomenclature of the five smooth stones of religious liberalism, which is used today even to distinguish Unitarian Universalism from many other traditions and how they approach the question of faith. So next graphic, please. Um, the five smooth stones of liberalism are, and I preached about learn a couple of Sundays ago, this morning, respect, we're going to touch on, and then in coming weeks, give, work, and finally, hope. So we'll take each of those in turn. And as I told you at the beginning of the series two weeks ago, this image of the five smooth stones has a bit of an edge to it. It comes from the story of David and Goliath, the Old Testament story. Surely you all know the story. More than 3,000 years ago when the army of Israel was threatened by destruction at the hands of the Philistine army, the two armies faced each other, and a powerful man named Goliath, a giant over nine feet wearing full armor, came out every day and mocked the Israeli army for uh, challenging them to fight. And Saul the king and all of the Israeli army were terrified by this giant. But one day David, who was just a teenager, uh, was at the battlefront and heard Goliath shouting his defiance. And he said, who is this Philistine that he should defy the armies of God? So David volunteered to King Saul to go fight Goliath without a shield, without any armor, with being a 97 pound weakling. So David went to the nearby stream and what did he pick out of the river? Five smooth stones, got the image? And you all know what happened. As Goliath moved in for a sure kill, David reached into his bag and flung one of the stones at Goliath, it struck him and knocked him out, and David came forward, took the, the monster's sword, and stabbed him to death, and the Israeli army was able to fight the Philistines off, if you believe that's actual history. It seems that what uh, Dr. Adams was saying is that these five smooth stones of our liberal religion are perhaps our best weapons, if you will, against religious orthodoxy that we throw these five stones at the giant of religious orthodoxy because we are kind of a 97 pound weakling when it comes to American denominations. Do you know how big we are? Total of 165,000 Americans. We don't even show up as under an asterisk in the, in the, in the tables of religious groups. In any case, um, this rather militaristic image, uh, Adams was with a bit of an edge saying, these are the, the best weapons we have to to share our faith. These are our tools. And so uh, can you project up the next list? Here is Here are the five stones again. I'm just going to say a sentence about them. We covered learn two weeks ago. That means that revelation is unsealed, and we must always, as you use, be learning new truths. That was my topic on the 16th of September. This morning, respect. We must be in right relationship with one another, with free consent, and no coercion when we do religion. And then in uh, a week, we're going to take the third smooth stone, give, which means we are morally obligated to seek and work for a just and loving community and world. We must be 
a prophetic voice in society. Then later in October, work. It is people, uh, Adams asserts, who must make good things happen. You can't rely on God or some other mysterious force to do good in the world. And the last sermon, which I'll preach on the last Sunday in October, hope. We must strive for an attitude of ultimate optimism. We must live in hope, and that's often a real challenge. So over the course of the autumn, I'm exploring all five of these, and I want to focus this morning on respect. Now, Adams, who for his entire life and career called himself a liberal Christian and a follower of Jesus, certainly believed that love and respect for all persons is perhaps the most central value and tenant in religion. That's what good Christianity teaches. But what he is specifically affirming here in the context of these five smooth stones that sets religious liberalism apart is more about the idea that when it comes to practicing religion in community, such as here, there must be freedom and respect for every individual and no coercion, no fear mongering, no threats or domination in your religious journey. What he's saying here, and this is pure UUism, is that each individual, each child of God, if you will, in his nomenclature, must be respected, trusted, and empowered to practice their religious journeys in free, authentic, and responsible ways. I'm gonna let Adams say it for himself. He is affirming, quote, and that's, that's the quote, the basic theological assertion that all human beings are children of God by which is meant, by which is meant that all persons by nature potentially share in the deepest meanings of existence. All have the capacity for discovering and responding to, quote, saving truth and all are responsible for selecting and putting into action the right means and ends of cooperation for the fulfillment of human destiny. And then he goes on. These religious affirmations are thus the basis of the liberals belief that the method of free inquiry, note the emphasis, is the necessary condition for the fullest apprehension of either truth or justice and also the preservation of human dignity, unquote. So what Adams is affirming here is his conviction that if religion is done right, and by that he means in a liberal and respectful way, no coercion, no authoritarianism is used, and the faithful come together in, quote, love and respect with mutual free consent as equal and worthy beings. One minister writing about this second stone says, uh, now this sounds obvious to us, that religion should be based on non-coercive, mutual respect of free consent. But it is not actually, that is not actually the standard in religion as a whole. When you consider that fear, guilt, and shame of many religions is used as a coercive tool this idea of Adams of mutual free consent of all things religious becomes somewhat revolutionary, unquote. I think it is undeniable that in many religions, fear, guilt, and coercion are considered acceptable tools to keep the faithful in line. Let's take, for example, the common belief found in so many religions, especially orthodox ones, that the individual can and should be, quote, damned to eternal hell, or at least somehow punished from on high if he or she does not precisely conform to what the church or doctrine or scriptures teach. The other way of saying this is that many Orthodox tradition teach that the only way you can get to heaven, the only way you can be eternally rewarded and blessed is by strictly conforming to what scripture and the church teaches. Did any of you grow up in a church like that? Where the path is only one way, thank you very much. Several times a year, the membership committee, we hold an introduction to UUism on a Saturday morning. And the first thing I do before I explain our faith is I say, tell me about 
your spiritual past. And you wouldn't believe the stories we get about the abuse and the crap from these all other traditions where they, they rack people with guilt and misery and shame for being who they are. You don't even have to be gay or lesbian to, to feel that. Roman Catholics tell me they got whacked on the, on the hand repeatedly or uh, actually abused by nuns. You've heard it all. Even some of the New Age cults, some of these Buddhist and uh, mystical groups have authoritarian leaders who abuse people and use coercion as a means to get what they want rather than to serve the faithful. Many folks in our Introduction to EU class uh, share that it was precisely spiritual coercion and authoritarianism that brought them to us. I can't stand this anymore. I need a place where I feel free and unbeat up. What Adams is affirming with the second stone of respect is that religious liberalism totally rejects the use of fear and coercion and infallible authority above to keep you in line or to tell you how to think. Um, so in this free and liberal church, again, the basic theological assertion is that all children, all human beings are children of God and that we must use the method of free inquiry unfettered by abuse. Each person who comes to this congregation is, I pray, shown equal respect and freedom and is empowered and entrusted to use their own hearts and minds establishing for themselves what is ultimately good and true and real. Now, sometimes you use flub up. Once at my River Road Church where I was for 12 years, a woman came up to me and said, you know, I expressed some hesitation to one of your members about abortion. And I was told, well, you don't belong here because we're all pro-choice here. That is not free inquiry. That cuts off dialogue. We have to be a congregation that really listens to one another across moral spectrums, across ideas. You can say to someone, gee, I've come to different conclusions, but you can't say, well, we're all pro-choice here. You don't belong here. That's not who we are at our best. Again, what Adams means when he's, uh, what he's saying in this quote is all persons by nature have the capacity for discovering and responding to saving truth. And he goes on to affirm that this is why liberal religion believes that the method of free inquiry and open dialogue is the necessary condition, condition for the fullest apprehension of either truth, justice, and the preservation of human dignity. We're only gonna to get to the best truths, the most representative truths for all of us by truly listening to one another and giving each other the freedom to have a spiritual or ethical perspective that may not be shared by everyone. Now, it will come as no surprise to you that this is precisely where Orthodox religions focus their criticism of our approach to religion. They say, you liberals are totally wrong about the human capacity for every individual to discern and respond to ultimate goodness and truth by use of their own free inquiry. Conservatives say human nature is full of sin and error and weakness, original sin, where we say human beings come into the world with original blessing, but that's another topic for another day. And the conservatives say, True religious authority for what is true and good comes from an on high, permanent, once and for all, reliable source, either Jesus or God or scripture. Given their obvious fallibilities, individual people cannot be trusted with the authority to employ their own reason and conscience to decide what uh, Adams calls the saving truths. That's what orthodoxy says, no way. And this is where Orthodox religions also throw at us the accusation, oh, you Unitarian Universalists, you're the church where you can believe anything you want. That is not who we are. More on that later. And they say, you religious liberals have too much freedom, too much respect for every individual, not enough authority from above. 
Now to answer this criticism and to answer it we shall, I have to go back to the first sermon about the sources of Unitarian Universalism. In our bylaws as a denomination, first we have our seven principles, and then we have a statement of the sources to which we go to discover truth. And these, do we have them up? The first one, the first a a source is the direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces which create and uphold life. And then it goes on to articulate other ones, words and deeds of prophetic men and women, including the words of Jesus and his teachings and Buddha. The third, wisdom from world's religions, which inspire us. All world's religions have some truth for us to to garner. And then because we come out of the Judeo-Christian heritage, Jewish and Christian teachings, which call us to respond to God's love by loving our neighbors as ourselves. And because we are a largely humanist organization now, humanist teachings is number five. And finally, the the spiritual teachings of earth-centered traditions, which you heard about last Sunday from the uh, service where we talked a little bit about earth-centered and being in harmony with the rhythms of nature. So these are the guidelines, the guardrails as for us as to where we freely search for truth and meaning in our religious lives. But you will notice that the first source, the beginning point of discernment is not the Bible. It is it is your own direct experience with the world. You are entrusted here to use your reason and your conscience. These are not infallible sources, but to use your reason and your conscience as you stumble or move joyfully toward truths and meanings that work for you, what is really good. And again, we do it in process with one another, listening to one another, because we realize that no one person sees the entire world nor the entire reality picture. So here in this liberal religious community, you are not, as some conservative traditions accuse us, you are not irresponsibly free to quote, believe anything you want, like unicorns, uh, pink unicorns saving the world. Things, indeed, the exact opposite is the case. As a religious liberal, you can only believe in what your heart and mind tell you is true, tell you is real, tell you is good. You do not have freedom to wander from where uh, the truths that you discover. Let me say all this a little bit differently. When you come here to worship on Sunday morning or to attend an adult education class, no minister or other church leader will try to use fear or threats or coercion to get you to believe something or for you to tow some sort of predetermined ethical or theological line, belief or non-belief in God, belief in abortion or not abortion. Because here at UCR, we are part of the free church tradition. We will always try to respect and empower you to use your own heart and mind, your own direct experience, your own conscience and reason to find what will work for you. We are not going to threaten you with eternal damnation if you do not believe as I do. We will not tell you what to think or how to be responsibly human. We may make suggestions to you or remind you of some of the historic truths that all religions teach like the golden rule. We will remind you of those things and hopefully persuade you of them, but we will not dictate absolute truths to you. So here in this liberal as opposed to orthodox community, we freely come together as Adam says, by mutual consent in genuine respect and trust to do this complicated and endless work. You know, some people say, oh, being a UU is easy. You just kind of follow your own dictates. No, it means you have to work all the time at clarifying. And, you know, being a Unitarian Universalist is devoting a lifetime to becoming the best person you can and to, and to discern the most clear truths and meanings for yourself and to modify your behavior constantly in accordance with your values. It is... Um, one of the uh, words that is helpful for Unitarian Universalists, there should be coherence 
in your life between what you say you believe and how you live. There was an old famous Unitarian marquee sign for announcing a sermon. If being a UU were against the law, would there be enough evidence to convict you? That's the message. You got to work at this all the time. And again, that, remember, that reminds us that we must be in genuine, open, fair dialogue with one another, even about abortion, even about the death penalty, even about um, <clears throat> fair wage laws. We will disagree on some of these things, on taxation, on Republican versus Democrat. We do not have a consensus once and for all eternally handed down. Thank you very much. What I'm suggesting to you is that every Unitarian Universalist congregation is a pure and radical spiritual democracy. A pure and radical spiritual democracy where every individual has the equal right and responsibility to think for themselves and move toward a more authentic and more moral and clear a way of life for them. And I just want to remind you of the seven principles of Unitarian Universalism. You know, because we believe in these things, these are, again, guidelines and guideposts. We are not just free to believe anything we want. We do have guardrails on our freedom, and these come out of, of those sources of religion. The principles and the sources are directly related to one another. What James Luther Adams reminds us with this all important second stone of Unitarian Universalism is that how we do religion with one another, with respect and freedom, uh, and with and respect and freedom for the authority and wisdom of each person is every bit as important. How we do religion, the epistemology, how we go about this is almost as important as where we end up as what our conclusions are. Methodology and end product are both important. You cannot reach a good end product if you dictate and morally browbeat uh, other people into thinking what you or what some old historical faith once thought. Here in this religious liberal community, we promise we will always find respect and trust for you as together we move down our respective spiritual paths, hopefully parallel roughly with, again, with guidelines so that we don't far, uh, stray too far off the good human path. This is not an easy journey. Unitarian Universalism is not the lowest common denominator of all faiths. In fact, it's one of the most damn demanding things. I wish sometimes I could be a fundamentalist Christian or a Roman Catholic. I just, everything would be laid out for me and I'd know where to go. I don't know any of that. I got to work every damn day to become a better person and to find more truth and meaning. And with a little trepidation, I invite all of you on that same path. And I say and mean this morning, amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 293 in the gray hymnal, O Star of Truth. Um, words will be uh, in the chat box on Zoom. Feel free to sing along at home. If you're here in the congregation, uh, please rise and stand as you are able in spirit or in body and join me in singing, O Star of Truth.
And I send you on your way this week with these words of George Beauchamp. The most necessary of all faiths is faith in ourselves. Not faith that we will always be wise, for we are often foolish, but faith that at our best we are capable of wisdom and that we can always be taught to be wiser than we are. Not faith that we will always be good, for we are sometimes wicked, but faith that we can ins be inspired to greater goodness and greater compassion. Not faith that we will always be strong and brave, for the best of us are often weak, but faith that we are capable of strength and that through faith in our potentialities comes greater firmness. Not faith that we are always wise or always good or always brave or always strong, but, we are capable, but that we are capable of becoming wise enough, good enough, brave enough, and strong enough to build a habitable world together. That's all you have to do. Amen. It is now time for us to extinguish our chalice. We extinguish this flame but not the light of hope and truth, nor the warmth of community, nor the fire of commitment. These we carry forth in our hearts until we are together again. Thank you, Catherine and Brienne, for the beautiful music today. Thank you, everyone who helped put together this service. It takes a lot of people, not just the people you see. There's our AV team. There's all the volunteers who are helping with the children and youth downstairs. There's the ushers, there's the greeters. There's Sterling, who was our worship associate today. Um, so thank you, everyone. Um, for those of you who are attending on Zoom, we invite you to join us for the virtual Greet Your Neighbor. You can also use the chat box as a um, receiving line to thank people for the service. Those of you in person today, we have coffee and tea, we have some homemade banana bread, we've got raffle tickets and books, we've got sign ups, so come join us in the East Foyer. And uh, have a great rest of the day, despite the rain. Thank you.